Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Sustaining Sustainability. I'm your host, C.B. Bhattacharya, Professor and Director of the Center for Sustainable Business at the University of Pittsburgh. Today, I'm delighted to say that we are joined from London, United Kingdom, by Mike Barry, a true leader in driving sustainable change. One of the pioneers of green business in the corporate world, he helped to develop, launch, and implement Marks & Spencer's groundbreaking sustainability program, Plan A. In 10 years, Plan A delivered 750 million pounds of net business benefit, and over the years has won 230 awards. During his time at Marks & Spencer, Mike helped evolve Plan A to become a change management program designed to make sustainability how m and did business. The business achieved zero waste to landfill status, moved to 100% renewable electricity, and achieved carbon neutrality across its global estate of stores, offices, and warehouses. Upon leaving Marks & Spencer's, Mike formed Mike Barry Company Limited in order to support organizations across society and the economy to deliver sustainable change. We have invited Mike here today to discuss his experience at Marks & Spencer's and more recently, his experience in sustainability consulting. Mike, welcome to the show. CB, delighted to be with you. Uh, before we dive into the big questions, could you begin by telling us about your own professional journey from Marks & Spencer's to being a strategic consultant and then starting MikeBarryCo.Earth? How would you define your personal purpose? Good goodness, that's a great question. And that gave me a real sense of social purpose. You know, how do you protect the most vulnerable people within my own country across the world? So I came through this a real social purpose lens initially. 1990s, I got a job as an environmental consultant. I learned the environmental dimension of an unsustainable world. Um, joined M&S, 19 years that we can unpick it a, a little later in the conversation. Loved it to bits. Became director of sustainable business reporting into the chief exec. And, you know, driving change, not just behind the scenes with suppliers, but also with front of house for 32 million customers. Love that to bits as well. Uh, but the time came to pass the baton to um, somebody better and younger than me, Carmel. And in a, a sense, it was a degree of professional euthanasia. There's too many old, white, grey-haired fellows like me blocking the positions of power. So I've taken myself away from that, deliberately not taking another chief sustainability officer role, even though it was tempting. And become a consultant, a guide, a mentor, a supporter of many organisations and deliberately working widely across the economy, not, not being sort of stuck in one silo as I was with retail for 19 years, even though I loved it. And just to finish off the introduction, working with four different types of clients, you know, big blue chips. Second type is public sector, which is good for as a business leader to come into that sector. Third is business platforms for shared journey on sustainability, bringing multiple different businesses to collaborate. And the fourth is with startups, these new businesses that will redefine the economy sustainably in the future as well. So CB, I've loved the journey. So what changes were incorporated in Marks & Spencer during your position as the Director of Sustainable Business? And what recommendations would you have for fellow retail giants kind of to leave their profit-centric mindset and adapt sustainable business strategies? Let me just sort of share the, the sort of the five steps to build a more sustainable business. Um, I learned the, in the business. And now just, you know, one word of context there. I joined Marks & Spencer in 2000. I had no line manager, no boss for the first four years, which in some ways was brilliant, but also showed probably how much concern the business had about these issues. But a new chief exec came in 2004, Sir Stuart Rose, now Lord Rose, brilliant man, turned the business around and put sustainability at the heart of it and gave us permission to move from the old world of corporate responsibility, managing the status quo, stopping bad things reputationally from happening to the business, to a transformational program where m and set out on a long journey to become a radically different organisation. And it's been tough. It's all set against the backdrop of lots of short-term commercial challenges in the marketplace generally and m and specifically. But by and large, the business has, has helped the business change and prosper um, in, that, in that space. So the five stages we went through with Plan A, back in 2007, we launched a 100-point set of commitments, time-bound, strong governance to deliver them. At the time, it was world-leading, and that built a firm foundation for, for us. You know, We were reducing energy use, packaging, plastic, food waste, improving human rights management, stopping deforestation, 
improve in fish sourcing, all the usual suspects. The second thing we did, though, we realized that a small team of 10 people in the middle of the business that I was leading couldn't possibly drive sustainability on its own. It needed 83,000 colleagues to do it. Um, so we had to integrate it into the business. So we worked with the business to set a new set of commitments to make sure that every item that MS sold each year to its 32 million customers, so about 3 billion items, a pair of shoes, ready meal, a bunch of flowers, a bottle of wine, had at least one plan A story to tell. And what we wanted to avoid was the trap of sustainability being about a niche, ethical, high-priced range in the corner of the shop, and then there's everything else. So we wanted to lift every product on the journey to be more sustainable. And by implication, every commercial colleague and therefore every supplier had to be involved in that journey as well. So that second phase of integration. The third phase was then a humble recognition that Little Old m and wasn't going to change the world on its own. Um, we had to build partnerships with competitors and peers to drive the change that we needed. Great example, m and using a few thousand tons of palm oil in hundreds of different products. It's a liquid commodity bought seven stages away from m and in distant supply chains. m and couldn't possibly change that on its own, but stood next to big competitors, good competitors like Tesco, Sainsbury's, Walmart, with peers like Pepsi, Coke, Nestle, Unilever. You could do something about it. So that was the third phase was build partnerships. The fourth phase was then to open up a conversation with those 32 million customers about how sustainability made a product better. Not just it was the right thing to do morally, but it delivered a better product for them. And what we wanted to do is broaden the definition of the word quality from a functional word, buttons don't drop, fall off coats, uh, packaging doesn't leak in the food hall, to one of emotional quality. This was made by people who cared for in a way that's good and sensitive to the environment that delivers a better product and experience for you. And then the fifth and final phase is where many businesses are starting to, to face into now, which is transformation, a recognition that you can't just keep flogging more stuff each year. You have to profoundly change your business model. We've seen it in power, the shift from coal to wind, in mobility, the shift from diesel to electric. And now the same will come to the food sector, the shift from meat-based to plant-based and the world of clothing, where it once throw it away fast fashion to circular resale, repair and rental. All very exciting. So that's what I've learned, CB, an awful lot. There has been a long battle, as you know, between cheaper resources versus cleaner resources. In one of your blogs, Climate Action, we need more pace, we need more scale. You talk about solutions to reduce carbon footprints, but how do we promote small scale industries, you know, to kind of transform themselves to sustainable businesses? when they're still relying on the traditional process of manufacturing? I think we've got most of the technologies we need to become a fundamentally more sustainable society and a more sustainable supporting economy to that society. It's a question now about how we deploy them with scale and pace. So I, I love what businesses like Unilever are doing. I work with them outstanding, you know, world class, and they're becoming ever better. But we need 100, we need 1,000, we need 10,000, we need 100,000 companies to do what Unilever are doing today. So, so almost my ask is not that we focus on the, these leaders becoming ever better. They'll do that themselves. It's how we deploy change across the wider economy. Now, that can come from two or three different ways. One is voluntarily through corporate supply chains, this concept of scope three emissions, where big corporates like the Tesco, the Walmart, the Amazons, the Unilevers, the Cokes drive change across thousands of suppliers factories and farms around the world, raw material sources. And they say that this is how we do business. If you're going to be selling products to us in the future, you have to do this. It's not a question of auditing you and holding you to a standard. It's a simple question of if you want to be doing business with us, you're doing it sustainable. Um, and these businesses are not just sending an email from the chief exec to another chief exec saying, jump to it. They're offering more and more support. You've got the BT Unilever uh, Telefonica effort with the um, SME Climate Hub, helping very small businesses without the resource of a central team to grapple with and respond to these new challenges. So that's put number one, voluntary action. Second scaling mechanism is then increasing number of business partnerships across the economy. So that's the second way of driving scale is getting all the participants in the sector to work together. The third is clearly mandation through regulation and law. And I think we've seen more and more marketplaces, including the UK, enshrined in legislation that we will become a net zero economy by 2050. That means that everybody has to respond to that challenge and the detailed policies on wind and mobility and heating and diet that come out of that. And again, I see that with the new Biden administration in the States as well. Welcome, welcome shift there. 
Um, and the fourth thing is investors. Again, investors, again, on their scope three, having to take responsibility for not just their own bank branches and offices and their impact on the environment and people, but the businesses that they lend to, they finance, they invest in as well, their scope three. And that's driving scale change. So at the end point of all this CB by you know 2030, we need hundreds of thousands, if not millions of companies participating, not just the best getting even better. Tall order indeed, but if we have all hands on deck, not impossible for sure. Now with the COVID pandemic on rise, I mean, you know, has sustainability taken a backseat in the many companies that you now work with? I mean, maybe this might be a good opportunity to describe some of the companies and the current projects you are working on, you know, to the extent that you're able to share uh, with our listeners. Of, of course, CB, and it, it just a reflection on that. I mean, when the pandemic first hit here in the UK back, last, back in March, so 15 months ago now, my business stopped two weeks. Nothing happened. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, I'm out here on my own, no safety net of a corporate life. Then it all started again. And I've been flat out absolutely every hour I could work. I've worked ever since. And that's because I think business is waking up to the fact that the pandemic is awful. It's a dreadful impact on many livelihoods and lives and businesses, but we'll get through it. And at the other end of the pandemic is a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, a crisis of, of inequality and well-being that still has to be solved. And they need people to come in and help them, support them in-house and as consultants. So that's my little story. And I, I think the other thing that businesses is, is recognising is that this is here to stay. So one of the things I've done in the last three months, I've read through 160 citizen surveys from around the world as to how people feel about sustainability. About a third of them from before the pandemic, two thirds of them since. Consistently, they're telling me that people are even more interested in responding to the climate crisis and all the other challenges we've got. Virtually in every marketplace I've seen, 70% of people are saying they are somewhat or very worried about climate change. They want business and government to act. I, you know, you've had complicated politics there in the state over the last four or five years. Despite that, I think the number of people somewhat are very concerned in the states has gone up from 60% back in the 2015, 2016 to 80% now. So again, the, the noise of the politics has not shifted people's journey on this. The pandemic has in, inevitably made people focus immediately on their livelihoods, their safety, their friends, their families, of course. So maybe climate change is not a dominant part of the conversation it was 18 months ago, but it'll come back. The underlying latent concern and expectation of business actions. And then the other thing I think we're seeing now is the scaling of these transfer transformational low carbon business models. I mentioned very briefly the shifts in power, the shift from a coal fired, gas fired, oil fired economy to one driven by wind, solar and battery storage. I'm struck by the fact that less than 12 years ago, the most valuable company on the planet of any type was ExxonMobil. And now it's been dropped from the SAP um, top 30 companies in the States, let alone the wider world. Tesla was worth, I think, about 12 billion US dollars back in 2013. Now it's worth more than, at times, all the other car companies on the planet put together. And I think business leaders are realizing that if you're on the wrong side of these shifts, it's no longer just a reputational punch up and bruising from an NGO. You're out of business. Same happening in food, same happening in fashion, same happening in technology, you name it. So the great transformation is coming, driven by policy, driven by citizens, driven by uh, marketplace disruptors. And I think that's what's kept it going through the pandemic. So I'm very excited about the next decade. The science is bleak, but I do think the economy can respond and put things right. Fascinating conversation, but we are coming to the close of our time. Are you able to tell us something about the kinds of projects you're working on and how you're widening the aperture of your lens from working for a single company to, you know, working for uh, industry at large in this transformational change process? So what, what I've learned is that every business has to address three simple questions. Why do I need to become sustainable? So this is the point about citizens wanting change, policy driving change, investors driving change, disruptors driving change. It's the boardroom understanding those, those pressures, those external um, pressures and how you respond to them in your business model, your culture, the products and services you sell. The second question then is, what do I need to do to become sustainable? It's the engine room, the classical carbon targets, water targets, human rights targets. Gives you credibility, reduces your footprint. You need reporting, governance, all the right things to make sure it's delivered. Otherwise, it's greenwash. And the third bit, 
how do I integrate it into my big, busy business, facing many short-term challenges? This is where many businesses still fall short, I think. You've got to integrate it into the how your colleagues work every day, the conversation with your customers about the products and services you sell them, clearly with your suppliers, your investors, and as we said, the wider ecosystem, the sector that you operate in well can share the journey of change. So the why, the what, the how are generic, and I've taken what I learned at M&S out into multiple different sectors, parts of the economy from that. But having said that, I'll remind you, I've come out of a position of power. I don't want to hold that. I think we need more diverse, younger, more brilliant leaders than me sat in the, the corner office now. My job is to coach, to mentor, to guide from behind the scenes. Really enjoying it. Fascinating stuff, Mike. Uh, sadly, we are coming to the close of our time, and I'm going to ask you for two calls to action. First, what call to action would you make to the you know, industry captains out there uh, who want to transform their businesses to be more sustainable? Simple CV. Frame this within your business as an issue of transformation, as much as digital is forcing you to transform how you do business, rather than a reputation issue. This is not about business as usual, and just making sure that a few bad things don't happen in factories on the other side of the world. This is about radically altering what you sell, how you do that, how you produce it. And if if you still think you can have an iterative version of your business model that you have today, forget it. You won't exist in five to 10 years' time. Prepare for transformation. And then finally, what call to action would you make to our other listeners out there? I, I think make sure your voice is heard. I, I think we're all as individuals... We're citizens, we're consumers, we're electors, we're investors, we're colleagues, we're families, we're neighbours in communities. And the most important thing you can do is have a conversation. And it's not to say that you need to become automatically an out-and-out advocate um, for, for all of this. Some people very, very proudly and very rightly do that. But for many of us, it's just about making sure in the workplace, when we're talking to financial advisors, when we're talking about businesses we might work for, you're asking the question. What are you doing? What are you doing? Challenging people, asking them to just step forward together to build a better world together. And together we can succeed. Mike Barry, thank you so much for taking time today to speak with us. CB, an actual, absolute pleasure. And this is your host, CB Bhattacharya, saying goodbye. And please join us next time for another edition of Sustaining Sustainability. Sustainability.